Warning, this episode contains some strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Tales from the Trunk, reading the stories that didn't and did make it. <laughs> I'm Hillary B. Disneyx. Listeners, I'm overjoyed to welcome back once again one of my favorite humans to make a podcast with. R.J. Theodore is an author, uh, a podcaster, <laughs> an ML, crucially, oh, yeah. this month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and, and the as I owner said, of a very excited dog. And the owner of a very excited dog. <laughs> Rekka, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Did I have Evie the last time I was on here? I don't remember. I think so, because I think you were on book tour in like February, March, April, sometime. Gosh, this... who knows? Yeah. yeah. Time is fake. Who Time knows? Time is absolutely fake, but Evie is very, very real, and and so are her emotions. Yes. <laughs> oh, but, uh, they, we'll let her. We'll let her wiggle and whine a little bit. It's not too bad. Yeah, I hope. that's her right. Yeah. She can be a podcaster too. <laughs> yeah, I actually haven't been much of a podcaster lately. I was just thinking about that the other day, that. Um, we make books started and we never found any trouble really you know getting together and mm-hmm. doing the recording and all around a busy schedule that we had before all this and now we have all this and suddenly like there is trouble just finding time and um and you know how it is it's the editing that really stops me from mm-hmm. uh, recording new episodes so it's been a while since i have you know really included the word podcaster in my bio i've i've kind of trimmed it out but i mean i am happy to be on someone else's podcast and let them do the editing as yeah. my do- dog barks in the background <laughs> i mean i think if you've been on a podcast more than like three or four times you become a podcaster yeah i'm just i'm just one of those uh, entities that floats around and <laughs> shows up now and then on on your favorite podcast without warning. The specter of podcasts past. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with that. Uh, so we are we are here uh, during this uh, time is fake. It is we're recording in October, but during mm. this NaNoWriMo of 2022. Mm-hmm. Here it comes again. To do a little bit of uh, comparative reading today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I apologize for half of what you're about to hear. <laughs> yeah, so um, I said to Hillary as we were planning this episode, you know, like, oh, I could read you some of my uh, my original manuscript from a NaNoWriMo when I wrote the book that is now finished and published and... Wouldn't that be fun? And then I went back and read some of it. I'm like, I can, I cannot do this to people. <laughs> I can't, I can't read you an entire chapter of this mess. Um, so what I decided maybe I'll do instead is read you like three pages, and then switch to the uh, the final version, and and like maybe as a balm, read you three <laughs> pages of that. So. Um, what I've got is the first chapter of Flotsam as written, I think this was like 2012, um, in a NaNoWriMo season, and I thought this was great stuff. Oh, and, yeah. And um, thankfully, I, I got some other opinions. I, <laughs> you know, I, I did not publish what you are about to hear. So this is the chapter, three pages of chapter one that didn't make it. All right. The pumpkins were glowing smoky purple as Talus left the warmth of the barracks and headed across the island toward the Keeper's Tower. 
She preferred to get a start on the day's work before their light turned to the golden orange of morning, when it would be too bright to work on the harness, even with her tinted goggles. No one cared what time of day Talis went about her daily tasks. It was just Maisie and her on this island, for three years now. Maisie only cared that the work got done, and Talis only cared that the work got done right. <laughs> the harnesses would need patching again, and there had been a frayed rope she wanted to repair before it gave. So long as the holes were patched so that the pumpkin didn't fall free of its harness and go floating off, no one would complain if Talus wanted to work in the earliest hours of morning. She shifted the bag of supplies on her shoulder as she hiked up a slow incline to free a knotted prayer lock that had got caught under the strap. It wasn't the duties that woke her up early. It was the dreams. Hmm. Three years ago, she had been a smuggler, second in command of a small ship doing supply runs and freelance work that couldn't be done through legal channels. They took a job not much different from the others, only had been a setup. They got pinched, all of them. Their airship was confiscated, probably burned in the oversized hearth of some fat crat on the inner islands. Hmm. And I do want to make a note that fat crat is no longer a term I will use. Yeah. He had closed calls before, how to start over. It wasn't getting caught that troubled her dreams at night. There had been an alchemist. She hadn't known what he was. Alchemy was supposed to be forbidden, unless you were one of Arthur Rack's people. No common cutter really knew a thing about alchemy, and while smuggling cross lines most common cutter never did, Talus had never asked the nature of some of the stranger items she had been hired to find for customers. So she sat down with this official in an interrogation room, and he'd put something in the water they offered her. She hadn't tasted anything that day, but she'd been tasting regret ever since. Hmm. It had made her say things, nothing true. They put her in front of her crew, the alchemist whispered words, and she spoke them aloud. She'd sounded sane and sober, enough to alienate everyone in the world she trusted. Since then, she'd been having strange dreams about the ring they'd pulled up on that salvage, about strange sigils she wasn't supposed to know anything about about the murmured whispers of an alchemist and the green mist that swirled around the nexus at the center of hole. She always woke sweating and with an incredible feeling of loss. Her friends, her ship, her old life, sure, but something else, like she'd forgotten something important. It needled at her every morning until she couldn't stay in bed any longer. She'd spend the day working herself ragged so she could just be exhausted enough to sleep a couple hours the next night before the dreams would start again. Mm. So I'll, I'll give you that. Um, a lot of exposition to start a book. Yep. And not a whole lot except to know that she wakes up early. So uh, we're just going to close that document and <laughs> hope that we never have to open it again. Even word is like spinning. Like, what do I do with this? And I say, just, just keep it. Just put it somewhere. Obviously, I was happy to find it yesterday, but now it can, it can kind of go away. Yeah. New chapter one. This is the published version of Watson. I'll give you about three pages, and of course, these are ebook pages. So who knows if it's the same length? Talus descended toward the sparkling layer of trash below her feet. Generations of detritus, coated in frost, shifted slowly and caught the light. She hung in open skies, a tiny dark figure on an impossibly thin thread. Her mm -hmm. airship, Windsaber, lurked in the shadow of a small island above her like the whore beast that lurked in the garbage below. Around her, the shrapnel of Peridot's tectonic crust puffered the skies, tiny islands not big enough to park a chair on. She might have said the chance to do something reckless like this was half the reason she was in her line of work. But there was no one to bluff except her crew on the other end of the comm, Doug, Tisker, and Sophie. And she owed them more than words. She owed them a job that didn't end up costing more than it paid. She owed them a ship that wasn't in constant want of repairs. She owed them a ship worthy of being called to home. A soft click sounded in the calm of her helmet, and Doug's voice cut through the quiet sounds of her rapid heartbeat and quick breaths. The voice tube transmission made him sound small and far away. Progressing well, Captain. How much farther do you need? Talus unclenched her jaw to answer. I guess I'm just about halfway down. Can't make out any details yet. Understood. There's plenty of length on the winch. Her first mate's voice was low and even, though his syllables were tight as a guitar string. Doug was worried. 
The milky descent suit didn't make it any easier to see the view below her. It was a one-size-fits-all antique, <laughs> big enough to wear over her clothes. Big enough that Doug, who towered above her and was thick with muscle, could have worn it if he was so worried. It was designed to keep her body heat in, and it was most definitely doing that. The musty wool lining felt moist after the short time she'd had it on. Her breath fogged the glass dome that protected her from the thin air, even though she wore a scarf over her mouth. Yet her fingers were still getting stiff with the cold. She could have worn thicker gloves if she was just going down to strap up a large object to tow out. But this time her quarry was smaller than that, and the thinner gloves provided better dexterity. From this distance, the garbage below her looked deceptively beautiful. A lazy flow of icy shapes caught the green light from Nexus, and their reflected light sparkled through the fogging on her helmet. It wasn't hard to imagine why there were so many stories about treasure down there. And there was treasure down there. <laughs> or, reckless or not, she wouldn't be dropping into it. The flotsam layer was where the dead went to be forgotten. Dead people, dead ships, dead technologies. Gravity trapped it all there kept it from dropping out of Herodo's atmosphere on the bottom side and drifting off into the stars. Silas Cutter created the Horvies centuries ago to prowl the frozen wreckage and clean things up a bit, with their vicious crunching jaws and fang-lined throats. Did her god intend for those beasts to prefer the frozen flesh of bodies to the wrecks? She wouldn't ask if she got the chance. She was here for the latter and glad to have the chance. If things went wrong, Talus would be on the menu, too. But the contract for this salvage made it worth the risk. She could make a lot of overdue repairs on Windsaber with the payoff. Her crew had been enthusiastic about the operation when she proposed it, knowing what kind of money a salvage might bring in. Better than the transport job she'd scrounged up of late. Not one of the trio had volunteered to make the descent, though. You're the reckless one, Cap, Tisker <laughs> told her at the time. The cheeky, bronze-skinned helmsman got away with the comment. He always did. His crooked, infectious grin and sparkling, deceptively innocent eyes transformed every jibe into a morale boost. Details emerged just a couple lengths below Talus. Large shapes at first, broken hulls of ships tangled in their own lift canvases, a roof, a wagon, an old tree trunk. Anything organic or burnable should have been composted or used for fuel, not pitched over island edge. But those hadn't always been the rules. Seventy-something generations back to the cataclysm that fractured Peridot and the recreation that made it what it was now. Seventy-something generations of garbage and waste swirled in the gravity trap. And down here, nothing ever decayed. Hmm. Soon she got close enough to see movement. The horror beasts pulling themselves across the wrecks, their undersides a chaos of tentacles. Their bodies flashed gray and silver in an imitation of the flotsam. They moved above and below the gravity line, scanning the field of garbage with cavernous eyes and probing the jetsam with sensitive bobbing whiskers, always in search of fresh additions to the flotsam layer, in search of food, in search of the dead, and they would find them. I'll stop there. I I love this book. <laughs> I have loved this book since I first read it. Oh. Uh I I also love so there there there's this thing that my brain does like everybody's brain makes associations mm -hmm. uh the association that my brain immediately made with the trunked opening was one of those just like random ass little things of in the uh second Wii Zelda game Skyward Sword there is a little island that you can visit that's got pumpkins on it and <laughs> as soon as like the word pumpkin appeared I just all I could think of was oh yeah Link diving down onto this little pumpkin island to run jobs. Oh, yeah. And the amazing thing is, of course, I have been working on this story. I think as um, any of your listeners who are familiar with me know, I've been working on this story since like, I graduated college in 2003. And I 
keep running into situations where I am told, oh, this is a lot like X or Y. Mm -hmm. And I've never experienced that story myself. And then I go and check it out and I'm like, oh, shit, I copied it without ever, you know, knowing it. And, um, and now I have learned that that creates comps and it's a good thing. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you are picturing Blink doing some of these things and that's totally fine. <laughs> um, that means that some of the work is done for me and I yeah. can relax a little bit about worrying that I'm not creating the world in enough detail. And I think that was one of the things that I did in that original manuscript was I tried to explain everything Mm -hmm. Down to the last button on someone's shirt, and I was so sure that I needed to provide all that information. When I have since learned that someone will open a book, and it doesn't matter what I wrote, they come to it with their own experience, and they are going to instantly transform my world into their world. And if you're an author and you can't deal with that, like mm -hmm. just write your stories and don't publish. If you're gonna put words out into the world people are going to bring their life to your story and that is why we do this that's why we share mm -hmm. unless it's not in which case like i said don't share it <laughs> yeah. if you need it to exist only as you imagine it it can only exist for you yeah i i i can't help but think of i think it was in Maybe it was an XKCD joke. It'll be in the show notes if I can if I can dredge it <laughs> right. up. But mm -hmm. uh, of uh, no, it wasn't an XKCD. Who knows? Uh, somebody talking about Neil Stevenson books and saying, you know, this thing, which is a sword, but cooler. <laughs> I mean. That is kind of how we all start when we're trying to find the, um, you know, the, the sales pitch for our book is we are grabbing at whatever already exists and trying to say it's that but this. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is the way we experience books. It's all words on the page. I, um, some people may know I originally tried, like I said, from graduation, I was an art student. And I tried to make this a comic book, but I was putting so much effort into the pages. I looked at this and I said, I'm never going to finish this. Mm -hmm. And I was killing my back working on it because I worked on one of those lap desks and oh, yep. bed. And I would sit on my bed with a movie playing on the TV and I would work on this thing and my posture was dying. Like, <laughs> it, was, it was just curling around myself. I was, I was a knot in a tree trunk. And yeah. so I would only be able to do, I think it took me two weeks per page. Oof. And that is before I even like applied the text and dialogue and, you know, scanned the thing and got it in the computer. I was never going to finish that story. Yeah. And I got to a point where as I realized this, I also realized I wanted to go back and change things. <laughs> so, um, I did try to start over and do it faster without all that detail, and then I just wasn't happy with it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a world where it was alive. I didn't want to create something quick and easy and passing. And so at some point, I realized I had been afraid of writing it mm -hmm. because I worked in marketing after I graduated, and I was convinced that... The quote was, people don't read and they don't listen. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of a quote of the marketing world. And I applied it to story fact and fiction. And that is not what that applies to. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually I realized, okay, I was at work one day and I was um, reading on my lunch break on my Kindle. And it was torturing me to go back to work at my computer because I just wanted to keep reading. And I said, wait a minute, I'm addicted to reading. Mm -hmm. Kindles are selling really big right now. I'm reading The Hunger Games. Um, there's also, you know, the uh, unfortunate now, but at the time, didn't know this, the Harry Potter series. Mm -hmm. And people are going up the wall for books. 
why do I think no one's reading? Yeah. Because a marketing guy told me that? There's plenty of other things he told me that like made me not value him as a human, so I don't know why I listened to him on this point. So I decided, and I think this was 2010, that I was going to stop drawing the pages and just do the part that I was really enjoying, which was writing. You know, up until this point, mm-hmm. it been like a screenplay for the comic, but I started over, and as you know, as you saw, I was still doing my first million words and you know yep. <laughs> breaking into the industry. But um, I I wrote it for like the next I don't know like six nanorimos, and finally decided. Um, well, my spouse said to me, "What if you?" finished it because i <laughs> every nanorimo i went back in and i i worked on it again and i kind of started from the beginning and i changed some things and and then he mood, said mood, what mood. if you finish it <laughs> you know and so i decided to um hire a story editor and you know suddenly i was in the process of publishing this thing and I haven't looked back since, mm-hmm. and now it is a trilogy that is about to be finished for the first time, <laughs> actually finished. Um, this December, book three comes out. It's yeah, crazy. and uh, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but uh, the first time you came on this show, you were reading a uh, trunked section of book three. Book three is done. I have... Um, done nothing (laughs) like it's actually done it's the strangest feeling that i am done with this entire series like Mm -hmm. it's it's behind me the only thing i have to do right now is like the graphic design the um you know getting the pages ready the the final Mm -hmm. print things you know um i'm self-employed so i am creating all the cover art you know working with companies to um promote it and all this so it's it's a very strange feeling to be Mm -hmm. done like this series is done the um you did it you know yeah i did it and it's uh it's strange because as i said i started off with this series and i kept rewriting it every year and never saw an end to it and then suddenly um i was inspired to just finish it and Mm-hmm. It's been through a lot. Like it was originally uh, made deal with a small press, and at the time that I joined them, I had written Flotsam and I had written Salvage, and those two books got edited. Mm-hmm. Af- you know, as um, the publisher talked me into making it a trilogy, because way back when I had been listening to self-published. Um, you know, podcasts and all this stuff. And I was planning a series that was just going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. And so I was imagining at least, at least 15 books in this series. Mm -hmm. And then I sold it to a small press and they said, um, how about a trilogy? And I said, oh, okay. (laughs) Uh, Now I'd already written books one and two. And I had a trilogy now to finish up collecting um all the 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 coins and the um the magical items that were in the story and Mm -hmm. the spirits that were you know making uh edges to the story and now i was gonna do it in three books but i'd already written two of them with a a large wide opening with, you know, maybe a dozen more books to go. And somehow I had to resolve all of that in one ending third book. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it that way. Uh, When I wrote the third book, I still expected to be published by that publisher. So I figured out how to resolve all of that mess Mm -hmm. in one book and did it because the publisher was basically making me do so. And then I was so proud of how I figured this out that as the publisher went out of business at the beginning of 2020, I was like, I could rewrite these. I could spell these out the way I had originally planned in, you know, a dozen books or so. Mm -hmm. And then I said, you know what? No, I did it. Um, You did that thing. 
I did that thing and I can be done with this trilogy and move on with my life and write other stories and start other series or write other, you know, one-offs. And Mm -hmm. it's amazing now that, you know, the next project in my book is not Flotsam anymore. It's not, um, you know, anything in Peridot. It is a totally different one-off standalone Mm -hmm. novel. And it's just so strange to be moving on from that series after so much of my life has been spent on these books. And Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not the way you want anybody to have to go through their (laughs) their book life and, um, and their career, but it's what I did and I made it and I am moving on with, uh, with my writing. It's, it's amazing that I'm going to have all these books published and on my shelf and move on. Mm-hmm. I mean, never thought that day was going to happen. I mean, and I did at once when I signed a contract with the publisher, but then they went away and I was like, Ooh, what happens now? Yeah. Luckily, you know, they made sure that everybody was able to get their rights back to their books, you know, that it wasn't caught up in a contract somewhere that they had with somebody else. Mm-hmm. And we all got our books back and we can all publish them now. It yeah. does mean that, you know, I had to self-publish because there's not really a publisher out there that wants to um, publish your book the second time. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm doing pretty well. I have sold a lot of copies of Flotsam and um, starting to get some, you know, movement where people have finally read it and are picking up salvage mm-hmm. and, um, you know, some pre-orders now in cast off. So, um it's amazing. I, I know I don't know how I got here, but here I am. It's so great. Yeah, it, it is a different life. And um, meanwhile, I've sold a whole bunch of short stories and mm-hmm. gotten published in magazines. And um, what a different person I am from the person <laughs> who started that copy of Flotsam that I that I started to read to you earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh- I I just want to point out, and this will be in the show notes for listeners who want to know uh, some of the background of of how you got there with book three suddenly, that uh, you do have a really great episode uh, that is in the We Make Books feed uh, talking with Jennifer Mace about uh, murderboarding (laughs) and... Uh, Thank how goodness to, for that that method. Oh my goodness! How to figure how, out how to do a book three? Oh my goodness! The last book in a series, figuring out like what your open questions are when you started, and mm-hmm. being able to uh, post them on the other end of book three's murder board and say like, okay, these need to be wrapped up, and almost write the story backward. You know, mm-hmm. how do I connect all the points from the end of book two to these open ends that need to get answered in book three when I thought I was going to be answering them across, you know, 12 more books? Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Yeah, absolutely go back and listen to the Murder Board episode on We Make Books because what a lifesaver. Uh, I don't really know good. how I don't know how this book would have turned out if I had not gotten that advice from Macy. Amazing advice. Admi- amazing. Uh, there's also, and this is not fully related except by way of We Make Books, uh, and I really love Premi's work, uh, there is a really great episode with Premi Muhammad talking about writing book three of a duology. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This, um, you know, my book three of a 12 book, three book series, a 12 book trilogy, and um, Premium Hamid's book three of a, of a book, bi- um, you know, I would say biology, yeah. uh, you know, duology. And we all end up on a different path than we start out on when we start these stories and we don't realize where we're going to end up. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote less books so that I can move on with my life. Preemie wrote more books because book one was so successful. Um, you don't know 
Yeah. <laughs> you don't know where your books are going. You don't know where your writing career is going. It's amazing. So, yeah, there's a lot of fun episodes on uh, We Make Books, and I know that Hillary's going to have them linked in the show notes. Absolutely um, so well. So I don't have to go hunt them down either. <laughs> but um, there are there are lots of pieces of advice that I've picked up over the years. And, um, you know, when I started, the only piece of advice I had was participate in NaNoWriMo. Mm -hmm. And so I approached NaNoWriMo as the answer to writing. But mm -hmm. really, I, I have to say, it is not so much the answer to all of your writing as it is a, a place where you can move from being somebody who knows they have an idea but doesn't know what to do with it to being somebody who has a draft and doesn't mm -hmm. know what to do with it. <laughs> you know, like, you're you're not going to learn everything in NaNoWriMo, but you are going to have the company and know that you are not alone working on a project in December. Um, it's not going to be your final draft. It's yeah. not going to be your final draft. Let me repeat that. It is not going to be your final draft. Just have fun. Yeah. And play around with it. I thought I wrote my final draft to salvage in uh, NaNoWriMo. It was so long. It was so, so long. I wrote like 111,000 words that NaNo, because it was my first NaNoWriMo where I was the uh, municipal liaison. Mm -hmm. And um, I was attending all these write-ins that I had set up. And so I was just quietly working on this book day in, day out. Um, the harder I worked on the book, the more I felt like I was doing justice to my region mm -hmm. <laughs> as their municipal liaison. And so I wrote this really, really long book. And then it got even longer as I edited it with my, um, with my publisher at the time. I, I wasn't, I hadn't gotten um, Flotsam published, uh, signed on to be published just yet. So again, I thought I was writing a second book in a very long series. Mm -hmm. But I didn't change a lot of it under the care of my publisher because after they published Flotsam, they kind of got sidetracked with the effort that I think eventually um, did them in, which mm -hmm. was signing on as a small press to have a publishing line of books where their books were getting published and getting stocked before they were released, as opposed to um, print on demand, like most independent authors mm -hmm. go through. So when they were print on demand, they were paying a lot of attention to the stories and putting a lot of effort into the books. But when they switch to printing a stock of books, suddenly all their attention was in dealing with that printer. Mm -hmm. And they lost the time that they were spending on their books. So as I was working on Salvage, I was adding more and more words to my story and getting away with it just because they didn't have the time to read and edit my book. Mm -hmm. And so um, at one point they asked me to cut it from like 170,000 words to 120. That was what they asked me to do. I cut, cut it. Cut a whole nano out of that. Yeah. And I cut it to, I think, 165,000 words, which took a lot of effort as it was. Because mm -hmm. again, this was me. Um, with very little help from my editor. I had a great editor at the time. Mm -hmm. However, he was a college teacher and he was much slower on the turnaround. So by the time he was sending me words to edit, I had also gone through my book and added more words. Oh, yeah. That he wasn't there to nip or cut. And I mean, like, it was a mess. And so um, when I finally republished salvage as a indie press again after mm -hmm. this, this um publisher shut down i cut 
down to less than 150,000 words finally. Like I finally had gone through enough that I realized the importance of um, not trying to explain every word to mm -hmm. my, my audience and to make the story to make the story rely on their mm -hmm. imagination a little bit so that um, I wasn't trying to tell them every word. <laughs> Sorry, my dog is uh, watching the squirrels again. There's one right outside our window. Oh, very exciting. Um, which is inside her fenced area. She usually can tolerate their existence outside the fenced area, but when they are inside the fenced area, that is when she knows that she could potentially go chase it. Yeah. But anyway, hopefully that squirrel is moving along now and I can keep going. But anyway, so this this trilogy has been through a lot. And then uh, I wrote it. I wrote the third book thanks to, like we said, the murder board. Mm -hmm. And no one at Parvis ever saw it because at that point they were on their path to shutting down. Yeah. And so... Um, they had actually asked me right before they completely disappeared on everybody to write a story, a completely standalone story in another world. Mm -hmm. Because they were feeling like my uh, space uh, fantasy half steampunk, and which, by the way, it was them who asked it to be more steampunk. Mm -hmm. um, they saw that they were having trouble getting all the readers that they thought they were going to get. So they wanted me to write something that was a little more normal science fiction mm -hmm. so that um, we could find readers in a standard category and that then they could get them addicted to my writing and then sell my trilogy in, in the future after right. we focused on this story. So now I've written another story, and I've finished my trilogy, and no one in Parvis is reading any of these. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, like six months later, they were pretty much, you know, gone. Yeah. Um, so that was a heck of an experience, and I don't know if I would have as much written and finished and ready to publish if it wasn't for all of that. So it's not like I really have a um you know a resentment of the parvis experience um it's mm -hmm. i'm still you know like i'm still friends with one of the editors there she's my co-host on um you know our podcast even though we haven't recorded in a while it's not because we're not friends it's just because our lives have changed a lot and yeah um, recording a, a regular podcast is a lot of work yeah. It's a, and editing it and putting it out, it's just, you know, it, it's something that we've put on the back burner for now. And it might come back, might not, who knows. But right mm -hmm. now, we're not doing it. But again, it's not because I totally resent Parvis or anything like that. In fact, I have an episode, um, an interview with Colin Coyle, who was the head of Parvis, that literally is just waiting for me to edit it and put it up, but I haven't yet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know... There's there's lots of um, friendliness that still goes, you know, between me and that publisher. Now there are obviously authors who didn't have that relationship and do resent that their stories didn't get finished uh, mm -hmm. as a result of Harvest shutting down. And I, you know, I definitely respect their upset and um, sad about it. And I just kind of, you know, I guess knowing the team at Parvis, I kind of was already getting ready to self-publish again mm -hmm. long before the series was, you know, back in my rights. So, yeah, um, you know, to bring this all back to NaNoWriMo, just write the thing, because who knows what's going to happen yeah. <laughs> between writing the first draft and getting it out in the world. The first draft you write as you sit down to participate in NaNoWriMo is just to have fun with it, mm -hmm. to explore your idea, to um, enjoy meeting your characters and figuring out how they relate to your world and how you relate to them. Yeah. Um, it 
you may think you're writing a romance and it turns out you're writing a, you know, um, explorer adventure, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Just, just have fun. If you have an idea, start there. It might last you 1500 words. And then the rest of it is half journaling, half poetry, half short story. And then at the end of the month, when you've taken a break, you realize, oh, yeah, I also know what I want to do with that first story again. And then you write some more words, and your words add up to 50,000 by the end of the month, but you've got more work to do. So don't mm -hmm. don't set out like you're going to finish a story and publish it November 15th, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, relax and let it come to you as it's going to come to you. Treat this more like a exploration and a fun adventure and treat it less like you're going to write a book and it's going to be ready to go out in the world. I mean, if you're somebody who does that regularly throughout the rest of the year, NaNoWriMo just happens to be a, a starting date and an ending date that maybe you have to work around. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I have felt for the last few years. It's like, NaNoWriMo comes in November and I'm busy doing something else. So like I try to fit it to NaNoWriMo, but usually it doesn't work out. And I just kind of like let go of the feeling. Yeah. But if you are um, ready to start something on day one and it's all new and you're going to write it until day 30 and you're all done, that's awesome. But don't, don't be hard at yourself. Like, Learn something from the process, mm -hmm. and don't and don't hold yourself t accountable like you're Stephen King and you're gonna just send it to print when you're done with it and there's not more work to do. Yeah, <laughs> especially yeah. if you're not Stephen King, <laughs> yeah. because the rest of us have to struggle to work as hard as we can to make the best book we can because someone out there is gonna hold us responsible for every grammar choice, whereas, yep. you know, there are people out there who can write whatever, hit it to their editor and never look at it again. Um, but everybody's experience is going to be different. Yeah. And just enjoy, um, you know, you got other people working with you at the same time, and that's a great feeling mm -hmm. that you're working with a group. Um, it can be your local group, it can be everyone online, it can be the folks on Twitter. I can be the folks on Discord. I mean, just find your team. Enjoy their company. Um, enjoy the process of writing something. And I For definitely sure. think, at the very least, it's going to teach you, you know, how you work on the process. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not about doing it the same way someone else. It's about figuring out how you enjoy writing. Because that's ultimately what you've got to do, yeah. is do the work yourself. So, yeah, the, I know it, that's not great. You know, NaNoWriMo speech. You, know? <laughs> like, uh -huh. you you get the emails from the official NaNoWriMo that give you lots of like the advice about actually finishing something and then how to get it published by January. But like, it's that's not the way it works. I think for ninety percent of people. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, like, having won my first and second NaNoWriMo's in 2020 and 2021, which, like, hell of a pair of years to actually win NaNoWriMo in. Right. Like, those two experiences, and I haven't finished either of those books. Sure. They're, they're yeah. still sitting in my... Google the Drive. The point is, you did some work. You got yeah. some writing done. That's the point. And I figured out, like, how I work a lot better. And and a lot of it is, like, popping into, popping into Slack or onto Twitter and announcing, I am going to write for the next half an hour. Does anybody want to join me? Yeah. Or, like, popping into a friend's DMs and being like, are you writing right now? I'm about to write right now. 
my favorite part of writing right now, year round, is the fact that I have a group of people and we all jump into Zoom every morning on the weekdays before we start our work day mm -hmm. and we just do whatever we need to do. Sometimes it's writing, other times, you know, it's my layout of my, you know, book before I send it to print. It's what it needs to be. But yeah. you have company and you're not alone doing it. And I think that's really where NaNoWriMo is a good cause. Like, that's why I donate to their charities. That's why I, I have a hundred NaNoWriMo t-shirts. Mm -hmm. It's not because NaNoWriMo has resulted in me creating a book every year that can go right to print. It's because it's a, a journey that I don't take alone mm -hmm. and that's really what matters yeah yeah and uh, one of the like one of the longest running themes of this show is like the best way for most people to write is to write in community is to have yeah. and it's so hard because you have to do it by yourself because you're focused on your words yeah but do it with people around you. Like, I have noticed, and I really miss, you know, that my um, my immune system is not what it used to be. And so I can't go and meet with people in person and write with them anymore. But when I could, mm -hmm. my goodness, how focused you got and how much, you know, effort just happened without you thinking about it because everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah was amazing it was magical and and that's what NaNoWriMo is it's the magic of knowing you're not alone and finding some way to tune into other people doing it so that you sort of are all supporting each other in the process mm-hmm yeah yeah I like I even before the whole COVID-19 thing happened I didn't pretty regularly go out to like <laughs> write with other people but like some of my best writing memories from the before times are like I just one time went to a bar and wrote with like wrote with Sarah Gailey mm -hmm. back uh back before most people had heard of Sarah Gailey <laughs> uh and like i i didn't turn out anything that was any good i didn't turn out anything that was that i used but i was writing in community and like that's that's the most important part of it like you don't have difference. to publish your NaNoWriMo book to get something out of NaNoWriMo right right yeah uh, i think getting community out of NaNoWriMo is the biggest reward entirely Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this being uh, for people who are may be taking uh, an hour out of their uh, writing schedule to listen to this <laughs> on release day, uh, you are now almost two thirds of the way through your book. Uh, Rekka, do you have any word uh, specific words of encouragement for that two thirds mark? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, that's usually where it gets really hard. Like, that is the moment in writing where suddenly you feel like you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you feel like the plan you made is all wrong. <laughs> that's where everyone's, you know, working with their head down, and so it's a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. Or... As I've noticed in my region, as um, the leader of my NaNoWriMo region, a lot of people have quit. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a tough period. And the only thing I can say is that you're going to come back and you're going to finish this. So just keep at it. And you will get to edit it later. Um, if you quit now you never find the happiness of finishing the project. Mm -hmm. There is, if, if you haven't finished something before, the feeling of walking away from it and being done is really weird. 
I can't even, like, for some people, it feels good. I find it really weird. It's so I walk bizarre. away, and, like, my purpose for existence is now over. And that sounds like a bad thing. But you sit down, and, like, TV is on. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of sit there and you have this weird sensation of having done this thing. And if you stop at the two-third point, you never get to feel this weirdness <laughs> and being done and everybody around you wanting to celebrate with you and you still not being sure how you really feel about it. Mm -hmm. But um, it is an amazing time and it is a huge accomplishment. And even if you decide, I don't like this process, you've done it once and now you know what it's like. And you can take, uh, I think NaNoWriMo in, encourages everybody to take December off. And when they, they do things to mm -hmm. um, edit your book and all that kind of stuff, they start in January. So you have December off. And it's, um, for many um, you know, people and their beliefs, it's a, a time of holiday and family and um, miracles and all this kind of stuff. And you have, you know, done a miracle mm -hmm. so many people in the world start writing a book and never finish and if you can just carry yourself through that two-thirds point and say i know it sucks right now but i'm gonna get past it and the emotion is gonna come back the motivation is gonna come back i'm gonna get to the end and conclude this thing and then i'm gonna have a story that mm -hmm. I can edit and, and finish and publish if I want or do whatever I want with. And no one else, it seems, is going to have that except for this very small crowd of people. Mm -hmm. And you are going to be among the elite story concluders. And so I, I really don't want you to give up. Hell even yeah. Even if it's difficult. It now is the time when you can prove to yourself that you've got it in you to finish. So um, whatever you have to sh promise you're going to buy yourself, mm -hmm. whatever you promise you're going to do, go somewhere, um, you know, adopt a puppy or a cat or, or an axolotl in, you know, December. At, when this is all done, promise yourself whatever you need to. Make a fresh pot of coffee or tea and get back to it and keep at it and just get to the end and you'll have done it and you'll know whether you ever want to do it again. But I promise you the two thirds part sucks no matter how many times you do this. <laughs> Every time you get to the two thirds and you're like, I don't like this. Factual. This a terrible book. I'm a terrible writer. I could be curled up watching TV right now. Mm -hmm. You could be. You might be a bad writer. The story might suck. But if you don't finish, you're never going to know whether the story actually sucks. Because I guarantee you, at two-thirds, everyone thinks their story sucks. Mm -hmm. So just keep at it. And I'll be there for the high five you need at the end. You just come find me. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, to, not to put you on the spot in a way that I don't normally put my guests on the spot, but uh, do you have a uh, dare or prompt that you can offer off the top of your head for uh, folks who are at that two-thirds point are feeling stuck and just need something uh, to get them in motion again? You know what's funny is I normally am tuned in to somebody on, uh, you know, uh, Twitter who gives you these little prompts every day. And I hate these prompts <laughs> because it never has anything to do with my story. Mm -hmm. But you make a good point that it's not that the prompt is going to belong in your story, but it's that it gives you something to think about and... Um, if you need to stop thinking about what you actually are writing right now, a little weird prompt, you know, that doesn't fit in your world at all is fine. And it might actually be the thing that gets you past that two thirds point 
Mm -hmm. you can delete it later. It doesn't have to stay in your story. Or you can do it as a side story. And then when you're done with your, you know, novel, you've got this side story that you can sell to a magazine. And then you're tying into an existing series. And suddenly, you know, people are coming to read your book that you read. Mm -hmm. Or that, rather that you wrote on your um, NaNoWriMo adventure. So, you know, maybe this isn't the worst idea. Uh, my problem is generally that all these prompts that I hear have to do with, like, earthly things, and <laughs> my stories almost never take place on Earth. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to think, okay, there's, like, two short stories I've written that take place on Earth, and all the rest <laughs> are somewhere else. So um, having one of these side stories is, is something I kind of object to, um, personally. But maybe it'll help somebody. And like I said, it's not important what you're writing right now. It's that you get to the end of the book. So whatever you need, if you need a side story. Okay. Here is a side story example. Forget your plot. <laughs> Forget that you are writing about the end of a world or a monster or that you are, you know, writing a world that's coming to war or, you know, stakes are really high. Just write about a day where your character gets a damn break. Ooh. Whatever it takes. They spend the day at a coffee shop with a friend. Um, they get to take a nap. Um, they're just, like, on a, on a flight to one place to the other, and there's nothing to do until they get there except, like, curl up with a blanket and be comfortable. Whatever your character needs in terms of a break right now, that you can give them a little bit of peace and quiet. And in a way, you can enjoy the peace of quiet with them. Try that. And then see if you can get back to the main story after they've had this break. Now, I know when I take a break, mm -hmm. suddenly I, ha I come up with an idea that I wasn't able to come up to with an answer for. So maybe your character at the end of this break, it's like, oh, shit, the thing I've been missing is this. And then maybe you, as you take a break from your main plot line, go, oh, shit, you're right. That's the thing we needed <laughs> to do. And then you can finish the story, and then you get past that two-thirds point, and then you win NaNoWriMo, and you've written a book, and you can publish it or not. You can edit it or not. You can share it or keep it to yourself. But you've done it, and that's really what I want for people who participate in nano is for them to do it and then they can decide whether they liked it or not later. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Low stakes, mm -hmm. 2K word, coffee shop AU of your exactly. book. Exactly. Yep. Yep. We need more of, you know, uh, what is it? Legends and lattes. We mm -hmm. need more of those right now. Um, that that was such an ex wonderful read. Yeah. And uh, I can definitely deal with more of those out in the world right now. Uh, agreed. So uh, this being November, quote unquote, time mm -hmm. is fake, who knows? Uh, yeah. This These aren't necessarily things that uh, folks will want to check out right now, but uh, is there anything that you've been... Listening to, reading, watching, mm. playing, otherwise experiencing that uh, you would recommend to people for their December break? Uh, so when NaNoWriMo is done and all they have to do is enjoy the, the last month of 2022, um, there have been some lovely releases this year. Um, there have been some great TV shows. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't enjoyed the, the pirate a story that we all have come to love, I think, then you should definitely check that out. Um, Our Flag Means Death is just like, what a treat from 2022. Mm -hmm. um, it, we may have had to deal with the pandemic, um, but we got this out of it, and that has just been amazing. I also, in terms of books, uh, recommend... Um, Oh, God. Well, I, I sadly have not read as much as I wanted this year. And most of what I've read have been friends' books that are not out yet mm -hmm. to give them some feedback. So it's tough to recommend a story. But I'm um, going to tell you that uh, John Wiswell has got a ton of stuff coming out and that came out this year and that that has all been delightful. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned Sarah already. 
Um, so that is. Um, I know, wouldn't I necessarily him. say that just like home is a, a cozy, yeah, light yeah. December read. But uh, if you want to like, if you want to experience the terror of the end of the year, yes, yes, I definitely would say that uh, as your winter grows darker, <laughs> that um, you can enjoy some some dips. Uh, let's see, what have I got? Um, I personally was uh recently in a collection called bridge to elsewhere so yes. i could recommend that it's an anthology it's got lx beckett john chu rin chapeco zigzag claiborne who i madly respect c.s cooney i'm sorry c.s.e cooney er donaldson rsa garcia who i keep ending up in uh collected stories with <laughs> which is kind of fun A.T. Greenblatt, or Carlos Hernandez, S.L. Huang, Justin C. Key, Mari Corisado, Malka Older, who we madly respect, mm-hmm. and Jolly Patel, and Alexander Pitchford, Jennifer Lee Rossman, um, myself, Peter Tierras, Valerie Valdez, who I also end up... Mad like, respect. Mad respect for, and we also kind of came up with a really cool story at the same time that kind of parallels. So if you haven't read her novels, definitely read those. NCG Volars, and it's edited by Alana Julie Abbott and Julia, Julia Rios, and that's got just a ton of good stuff, and of course, you know, everything that comes from um, our friend Dave at... Um, Neon Hemlock. Neon Hemlock, thank you. Yep. And so um, I'm in the uh, Neon Hemlock story uh, collection that's coming out later this year. It's just, there's... Um, a lot of short stories out there that, honestly, if you are tired, like, read a short story, because you don't mm-hmm. feel, like, committed to an enormous novel. Um, you can pick up a book with one author that you know, and you know you like them, and then you can discover other authors without the risk of, like, feeling like you wasted your time. And um, there's just so much out there that I wish I could say I've read at this point in the year, but this has been a weird year for me, and I I have not read nearly as much as I'd like. Um, And what I'm reading right now is, like, a secret. So, you know, (laughs) you can't can't always um, come to an author for good recommendations of what to read, but um, there is plenty out there. And, um, you know, check out uh, Twitter, and I will have some better answers, but like Hillary said, I I got kind of... Uh, centered without expecting to uh, make all these recommendations for some reason. So we will, uh, we will answer these on Twitter and continue to do so. Uh, And if you're looking for short story recommendations of what is brand new, uh, I will, as always, pitch our friend Charles Pissor's Quick Sips reviews. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Charles also has a uh, end of the month roundup every month of the best new queer short fiction. And I finally got to give him one this year. Um, every every time he would ask for those, I would be like, well, my story came out, but it doesn't, like, it doesn't center queerness. Mm-hmm. And so I finally, finally got my ace uh, romance space adventure story yeah. uh, out this year and finally got to give him one. I was very, very excited. That is, we we love to see it. Yeah. Finally, uh, before we wrap up, I do want to uh, give a quick shout out to book three of your trilogy, which we've talked around Thank a you. lot. Uh, yeah. But uh, do you have a a quick pitch for both the Peridot Shift trilogy in general and for book three? Oh, because book three, I, it's amazing that, like I said, I somehow wrapped up this whole damn thing mm-hmm. in one book after writing two books that I thought it was going to be like a dozen books or more. Um, I don't, uh, my heart belongs to the, um, you know, the methods we were talking about earlier, but uh, the Paradox Shift series is about to come to an end, and I cannot believe it. Um, so overall, I would say, uh, introduce my, my books by saying that on a planet cracked open by ancient magic, I mean, it was destroyed 
seven hundred years before my story even takes place. Mm -hmm. That that's where that's where we're starting. We love um, the world building. <laughs> Outlaws and pirates are the only ones with what it takes to save Peridot from its next apocalyptic threat. Um, that's my pitch for the whole series, and um, my pitch for Cast Off Book Three is that um, the Peridot is on the edge of annihilation. And with the very survival of the planet at stake, the crew of Fortune Storm, because we're now no longer on the original ship, <laughs> the crew of Fortune Storm sets upon a quest to reclaim pieces of the planet's trapped soul before they can be seized by those who would sacrifice everything and everyone in their race for power over everything. Also, and if you like the worst man... This is the book for you. <laughs> so, I mean, you get a lot of books where everyone falls in love with the main character. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of someone with a, a particular set of biceps um, mm -hmm. right this moment. And I, I don't necessarily have that character. I think people love my uh, younger part of the crew under Talus. They love, um, you know, Tisker and you know, my, my kids in my story, mm -hmm. but, um, what they really love is to hate my, my, not even my main villain. Mm -hmm. He's just this guy that freaking gets in the way every freaking time. <laughs> Hankirk is just out there causing problems and we love to hate him. We absolutely love to hate him. And that's, that's what we live for. And so I knew that, my conclusion needed to pay off this hate for Hankirk. <laughs> and I just have to say, I am so happy with the way it ends that I really hope that my readers who have put up with him for book one and two enjoy that he is going to spend the entire book getting shat upon, <laughs> even as he uh, continues to um, succeed in some of his tasks and <laughs> make an effort to, to play out things the way he wants them to play out. Um, he's Hankirk. He deserves nothing but the worst, and he is going to get it. So um, I really cannot wait to hear some people enjoy how this trilogy ends just for him. And then in my in my further books, I will focus on creating main characters that my my readers can fall in love with loving. But for now, m they have fallen in love with hating Hankirk, and um, he deserves it. Let's yeah. just put it that way. He's truly the worst. He is absolutely the worst. Uh, and listeners, if you want a, a preview of that book, uh, check out Rekka's first appearance on Tales from the Trunk, uh, mm. where... That book was in the trunk. It was in the trunk at the time because I, my publisher, where were they? I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but shouts now to Robot Dinosaur Press and the whole of the Chipped Cup Collective. Yes. Yes. It's, it's fantastic. Um, it's everything that you love about being with a small press and none of being trapped in relying on them to move forward with your process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Uh, just a, a quick mention of some of the other members of the collective. We've got uh, names and faces that you know and love, including Merck Fenn Wolfmore. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got Sarah Locke. We've... Uh, who else have we got? Um, uh, we've got Andy. Yes, we got Andy's doing a lot of stuff. Um, Nove Callum. That's who I really wanted to say. Star has been... Uh, creating some amazing artwork and creating some great mm -hmm. stories and uh, doing some of the, um, like, the short pieces uh, under Amazon's new program where you're, like, uh, releasing a chapter at a time. And I forget what the program is called, but um, Star has been really uh, taking advantage of that and doing a great job with it and then putting together the stories and releasing them as full books later. Um, but, you know, we said Merck Fenwell for... And um, let's see, Nia Quinn, we've got Carly St. George. Oh, yeah. um, we have a lot of like great names. Um, Juliet Kemp. Oh, and yeah. And no, yeah, like I said, Nove Kalem, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Andy Buchanan. Um, there's so much 
coming out under a you know like a publishing house that we just started really last year mm -hmm. and um it's amazing what we've been able to produce. We've got some that are, um, you know, multiple author publications, you know, short story collections. We've got some that are single author short story collections, um, you know, and of course, you know, that's where my stories that I've released already have been re-released. And there's just a lot there that you can find. And um, whatever you like, there's probably a, a story there for you to check yeah. out so um definitely go to robotdinosaurpress.com and check out the stories there and all all of our authors it's it's been amazing and i had um you know some worries getting into it because of all the lessons i'd learned under mm -hmm. um under parvis but it has been everything i loved about being associated with an, a small press and nothing that you know, hurt me mm -hmm. <laughs> the first time through. It's been great. It really has. Yeah. Shout, shouts to the whole Robot Dino Press crew. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I look forward to more, and there's always more coming out. Yeah. Uh, finally, and I, I know we've, we've talked around it a little bit already, but uh, Rekka, where can our listeners find you? <laughs> uh, the, I am easily found at rgtheodore.com. I've got um, pages there that'll direct you toward anything about me that you might be interested in, whether it's books, podcasts, um, mm -hmm. you know, short stories, long stories, um, my podcast appearances, my interviews online. It's all there um, to be found. And of course, you know, um, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Instagram is really where I have more fun. I go on Twitter, but I try not to stay because it hurts my soul to be mm -hmm. there. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Same thing. I don't enjoy it. Um, I'll post something occasionally for the people who only exist on Facebook, but then I run away again. So yeah. if you're looking to interact with me, Instagram is probably the place to do it. And you can also find photos of Evie. And of course, I have a Patreon um, where I really, you know, get real with my with my uh, true and dedicated uh, readers. So that's there too. Fantastic. RJTheodore.com. Yep. Best w and uh, for folks who just want to r jump straight onto Instagram or Twitter at Bitty Bitty Zap. Yes, that's where I am on any um, social media. You'll either find me as Bitty Bitty Zap or searching RJ Theodore. Of course, there's like Theodores and RJs all over the world. So um, mm -hmm. if you don't type it in right, or even if you do type it in right, sometimes it's still hard to find me. So Bitty Bitty Zap, just just do that. And if I'm not at Bitty Bitty Zap, then I probably don't like being there anyway. <laughs> Well, Rekka, it's been an absolute delight having you on the show once again. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for offering a lot of uh, really excellent words of wisdom for this. <laughs> words of wisdom, the don't worry about system. it. Just don't worry about it. That's my yeah. word of wisdom. Just do what you like doing, but try it out. If you haven't finished something yet, make make this year the year you finish it and then you'll have finished something and you can move on or you can do it again next year yeah you, but, you can um, hate it you can love it you can hate and love it at the same time which is frequently my experience do it. yeah yeah for sure so um definitely if you haven't finished a story before try to make this year the one you do and see how it feels i mean just find out do it for the first time yeah we believe in you we do. We definitely do. It is possible. Just make it short. Don't worry about it. Doesn't yeah. have to be fifty thousand words. I'm not going to tell. No, no. Well, we, our lips are sealed. <laughs> but we believe in you, and our lips are open to tell you that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Always happy to be here. Absolutely. Listeners, stick around uh, next month when we may or may not have a book tour. Who knows? I haven't, uh, I haven't decided yet. Uh, but when we will be talking with an author who took their book from NaNoWriMo to published, best-selling, amazing work, uh, author of The Unbroken, C.L. Clark, will be joining us. And just to, you know, fill that in, when I said I was reading something under a secret title, <laughs> it might have been from that series. 
Ooh. <laughs> uh, and I believe in January we will also be having Juliet Kemp on. So uh, look forward to all of those things. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is Paper Wings by Lillian Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Twitter at trunkcast, and I tweet at hbbisnyx. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject. Don't self-reject.